as saying this is the most beautiful event space for a bookstore ever, I think. So, the store is gorgeous. Um, so, I, <clears throat> I actually do have questions written down on my little iPad here, but I think this will be more conversational than anything. Um, Peter and I have spent a lot of time together. <laughs> and a lot of time talking about this book. <laughs> but so, which is excellent transition. Um, so talk a little bit about, first of all, why the book now and how the book came to be. Um, well, it, it, couldn't, it couldn't have come to be until we found the transcripts. Um, it had never really occurred to our family because, as many of you may know, my family's pretty private for the most part. Um, or if you don't know, we are kind of private. And um, it wasn't until we found transcripts in, well, we were painting my mother's house and we found two locked file cabinets down in the laundry room. And there were tons and tons of, of transcripts from interviews of um, my father and Stuart, not my father and Stuart Stern, but of all these other interviews that had been done, including mine, which was a little embarrassing since I was 21 and it was not very interesting. But, but um, so we found all these transcripts and we thought, oh my God, that we thought these had been, we thought dad had destroyed them. And he obviously hadn't because he had saved them in file cabinets. And then, after that, we were looking for, you know, we were going to put things away in the storage unit, and we found two boxes of his transcripts labeled PN History. And within those, once we read them, it literally said, this is for my children, and I want to dispel the fairy tale. I want to get, as he put it, the piranhas off, and I want to get the real story out there. And so my sisters and I talked about it a lot. And then we decided, well, this is obviously something he wanted. So that's when we <coughs> Peter. Happily. <laughs> pretty, pretty much that's how it went. Pretty happily. So, okay, this might be a hard question to answer. I don't think I've ever asked you this, but maybe I have. So how do you think your dad would have liked this finished book. It's, for, I don't know who, has anyone here read this book yet? Or this, is, yes, the publisher and the agent have read it. That, that's, a, that's a very good sign. So the rest of you, the rest of you are in for a real treat. But one of the things that's so astonishing, really, and unique, is how honest this book is. It's very, very surprising to me as an outsider. So how do you think your dad would have liked this finished product to, because it's so honest and he lays himself on the line? Well, I think he, I think, I think he would have been happy with it because it is literally his, it is his words. So I'm not sure how he couldn't be happy with it. I think um, he was in a time in his life when he was really kind of digging deep into some of the things that he wasn't real proud of or things that he regretted or things that he really wanted to deal with in his life. And as Peter said, it, it is really raw. It's actually very emotional when I, was reading his transcripts, I actually had to read, you know, 30, 40 pages and I have to put it down because it was so emotional to me. Um, but yeah, I, I think he would definitely like it. I think so too. <laughs> um, so, you know, this, I'm sort of, the publisher's Alfred A. Knopf and I'm sort of tooting Knopf's horn here, but this is relevant to whether Paul Newman would have liked this book I think it's one of the most beautiful book jackets of any book I've ever worked on. And it was a little controversial because as you can see, it's not the young, beautiful Paul Newman. It's the older Paul Newman who's half 
revealing and half hiding himself, which is kind of what the book is about. So when we first showed this to you and your sister and the other sisters with some trepidation, your reaction was you would have loved it partly because it's in black and white and it doesn't actually show his spectacular blue eyes. Yeah. And one of the things that your dad talks about, a long-winded lead up to this question, but, but relevant, is he didn't like being treated as decoration. That's his word that he used to talk about the way his mother saw him, which was one of the most powerful parts of the book. So I think he would have loved the jacket, and I know you think that, but talk a little bit about that feeling. He's, he's pretty harsh about both parents. Did he ever talk to you about his parents? Were you surprised when you read this in the transcripts? Um, yeah, yes and no. So I would say it was, it was so specific. Um, there are things in there that were very surprising and shocking to me. Um, I obviously knew that we didn't spend a lot of time with my grandmother, so that was pretty clear that there wasn't a real close relationship. I didn't realize, obviously, how difficult my father's childhood was. Um, but I do remember one time going to visit my grandmother and there was so much lead up prep before we got there. It was really, there was like a laundry list of stuff that we weren't allowed to do. I think I was maybe eight. And I remember walking into the house and just being completely terrified. You know, just, she was like, don't touch anything. There's, you know, your grandmother's very, doesn't, she doesn't like if you do this, and she doesn't, and I thought, oh God, okay. But, um, and all of us were very nervous around her. And um, so, I mean, I, I think it's very unfair for me to say anything disparaging about my grandmother, who I really didn't know her very well, but I do know that my father, we just didn't have a relationship, and that was because he obviously didn't, you know, she, she just wasn't around, she was never around, and I literally grew up with my mother's mother, and she lived down the street, so. Well, one of the, again, you all have to read this book because it will really surprise you, and we'll get into things that surprised you reading it, but, Cleo wrote the afterword to this book, and one of the reasons you so wanted to write the afterword, um, and one of the reasons I think you wanted to publish the book, as you said when we first started talking, your father was a much different person and a much better person at the end of his life than he was at the beginning of his life. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Because the end of his life, you were privy to, and the book stops really before we get to the very end. Um, yeah, Peter and I actually talked a lot about this, and I think what is the most surprising about the book is that my, so I'll preface it with the fact that my father's father passed away in his mid-50s, and I honestly think that my father did not think he was going to live to a ripe old age at all. Um, so by the time he was in his early 60s and he was really doing some serious soul searching, you know, I think this was part of it, this was part of his journey. This, it's, it's five years from 1986 to 1991 of interviews and it was really a pivotal time for him. I mean, he, it was almost like self-therapy um, and, and it's, so it is super raw, and I think that he emerged on the other side after doing all this really self-involved work and like trying to mend relationships and that he kind of blossomed into this other, and I can't say he necessarily was like a better person, he was just a better version of himself. I think he was so much more comfortable in his skin when he emerged on the other side. Um, 
that I, you know, poor Peter, I just pounded him with my wanting to do an afterward. I was like, it's really important, I think, people no, need that to was know what he, what he needed to, what he had, what he did afterwards, because I think it's so important. It was fine, she was just, a little, late. A, she was just a little late delivering it. Oh, I <laughs> beg to differ, you were an extremely good writer. I had to do almost nothing on this. Your writing was great. That, don't, don't let her get away with that one. Um, so, how do you think he really blossomed in those last 10 years? I mean, obviously, and I know this is important to you, 20 years, yes, yeah, sorry. Um, definitely. Certainly the, the charity work he did was important to him and important to you, and the race car driving. So you, can you talk a little bit about both of those? Because I know one is really important to you and one sort of terrified the whole family, so. <laughs> well, you can figure out which is which. <laughs> well, I, well, I think what's what, um, well, let me back up. So, so yes, um, he did emerge on the other side, really finding his passion, which, you know, everyone always thought he was passionate about his work. He certainly was. He worked really hard at being the best actor he could be. And, and um, I mean, he was a student until the day he died, absolutely. Um, but his real passion was racing. And when he found that, when he was in his, when he was doing winning, I think it was in his mid forties, he, he says actually in the transcripts, it was the first time that he ever felt graceful doing anything. And um, when we were growing up, he always said to us, you gotta find your passion. It may not be what you do in your job, but if you find a passion, something you're truly passionate about, you will, it will feed your soul. That's why can you read because I found my passion in writing. Um, was my poor mother, you know, between the race car driving and me doing show jumping, you know, it's like every other weekend she had to watch her children, meet her child and her husband, like trying to come in here and carry. Um, but the family, the racing really was um, just, his other love, and I think if he could have given up acting and just raced until the end, he would have been really happy doing that. We loved it, though. Mom, the kids, yeah. yeah. We loved it, because we all got to get in the cars after he won and get driven around the track. Mom was terrified. Well, what's amazing, too, is Cleo said he started in his mid-40s. That's the retirement age for most race car drivers and continued until he was 80. And how old was he when he won his last race? He, well, so, so first of all, he won, he actually won 24 hours at Daytona when he was 70 years old and was listed, at, he's, in, he's in the Guinness Book of World Records as the oldest driver to ever win a professionally sanctioned race, still, at 70. Um, and this, way, going 210 down the straightaway at 70 miles an hour. It's so My annoying mother. because he was also cool and Luke and yeah. Hyde, you know, it's like. Yeah, no, I mean, well, but it, you know, my poor mother. And then actually my husband over here. Um, <laughs> um, my husband and I went to see him do 24 hours of Daytona when he was 80. And it was pouring rain. I mean, torrential, Florida rain you know, like waterfall rain. And his windshield wipers broke. And he's driving at night. And I, I mean, when he, I, I have always been super competitive. I mean, he and I loved like competitive sports. He, when he got in the car, Kurt and I were actually in the pits. And I, I mean, I almost burst into tears watching him get into the car. And I remember saying to Kurt, I'm so grateful mom's not here. <laughs> I mean, I, there's no way your car could take it. Huh. Um, it's really one of the great athletic feats ever. Oh. I mean, it's astonishing that he is racing at 80 and winning in his 70s. It's incredible. He, he won, you're right, he won his last race at 82, almost a year to the day before he died. Mm -hmm. He almost beat the track record. Anyways, find, find your passion. It's my it's our lesson. Well, it is also one of the most interesting things in the book as well, because he 
writes and talks about racing with such passion. It's quite surprising and quite beautiful. And other people, because one of the things that we haven't really covered, the book is 70% your father. I never bothered to check the exact amount, maybe a bit more than that. And 25 or 30 percent other people talking about Paul Newman, which, and I will say, Clea pushed for more and more of that correctly. So I might have fought back a little bit, but correctly so it turns out, because those voices add such depth to the book as well as humor and other sides of your father. And there are several racers who talk about that in his competitive spirit. Um, so, oh, I forgot about the book. We're not kicking you off the stage. You can talk about the no, plan. I'm sorry, I, I got so excited about the racing thing because I, I like racing. I mean, I, I actually at one point, I said to mom, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start racing cars. And she looked at me and she said, under no circumstances is my youngest daughter doing show jumping and racing at the same time, <laughs> two most dangerous sports there are. You anyway. had a point. Yeah. But, so no. talk a bit because oh, the other yeah. thing in the last part of Paul Newman's life was his extraordinary philanthropy. And I just saw a statistic, I think, well, I'm sure that I know this is in the book, but it was, it was reiterated to me today, that by, in the 20th century, he gave away more money than any other person proportionately to what he earned in the entire 20th century of the United States, which is astonishing. So talk a little bit about, because it's also your passion. Um, well, it's interesting. So, so he, he got really organized in the last 20 years of doing philanthropy and politically getting his voice out there and all that. Be before, he was crazy generous. And I mean, his, his poor accountant used to say, you know, I don't even, all I know is he will send me notes and saying, I met this person, you need to send them a car, I, you know, do this, I need, you need to do this, he has three children, I need to help him with this. I mean, he was just always like that. But as, when he kind of went through this journey of deciding what he wanted to focus the end of his life on and what he wanted to do, he, he became incredibly organized about his philanthropy and he really found the things that he felt were important, and he really devoted, I, I mean, between the racing and the philanthropy, he barely had any time to work. I mean, it was it was actually kind of funny, you know, studios would call, they'd send him some scripts, and they'd say, you know, Paul, we really want to do this amazing thing, this amazing script, this amazing, you know, Martin Scorsese is directing it, and this person, you know, whoever's going to be in it, and Dad would say, well, you know, I, I can shoot it, but I can't do it any time during the race season. So that's pretty much like September through, you know, April. And then I've got all these major events and things I have to do for the camps or for Safe Water Network or whatever. And then so there's like a two-month period that I can do some shooting. <laughs> And yet, his, some of his, his agent greatest, was not happy. <laughs> but some of his greatest work was during that period as well. When he was doing some amazing, he was doing some amazing. He was anyway the so, best, the best version of himself. So let's go away from the book a little bit. Let's let's go into you. Mm -hmm. um, no, this will be easy. Mm -hmm. um, so. In fact, I'll start with a seriously softball question, but I think everyone wants to know this. So, so what of not just your father's, but your mother's movies, what are your favorites? What moved you in his films and her films the most? Are there particular movies that moved you, that affected you, that struck home? Um, my So my favorite film of my father's I have three. So I have HUD, which I just loved. Um, well, yeah. And then um, The Sting, okay, no, 
know, stain, stain was, it's, it's actually, after my father passed away, the stain was the only movie that I could actually watch without just becoming a puddle. Um, and I don't know why that is, but for some reason that movie, I don't know if it's just because he almost felt like a character actor in that film, and I just loved him in that film so much. Um, the verdict was, I think, the first role that I ever saw him in where I didn't, although I knew it was my father, he was so good, I didn't know it was my father. Um, and then as an older man, so maybe four of us, um, was Nobody's Fool, which Nobody's Fool to me was, you know, him playing grandpa, which was another, another one of his passions. How about your mom? How about her movies? Are there any that particularly get to you or the ones they did together? Um, honestly, there's not a film that my mother has done that I don't, that doesn't just blow my socks off. Um, even when she was bad, she was better than most <laughs> anybody. You know? she, she, when she was never bad. Um, there's some movies that I liked better than others. I mean, some of her greatest work, like, you know, Marigolds and, you know, some of her earlier Three Faces of Eve, those movies kind of scared me because she was so good that she, frankly, was scary. I mean, I remember when she was making Marigolds, I was young, and I'm the youngest of, of six, so, I remember dad coming home because he was directing her and he would walk into the house before mom and he'd open the door and he'd say, okay, your mother's coming. <laughs> so, <laughs> scatter. And all of us would just be like, Psh! because she was in character for two and a half months and it was not a pretty character. <laughs> but she was, yeah, I, I Mr. Actually, and Mrs. Bridge. Well, I forget whether you said this or whether Lissy, another sister very involved in the book, said this recently, that in Mr. and Mrs. Bridge, playing Mr. Bridge, he was playing his father. Yes. Which Absolutely. When, when you, which I did, went back to watch that movie again. It happened to be two of my favorite books. But people haven't read the books. They're two of the best books of the last century, but the movie is extraordinary. And they're both of your parents are just breathtaking in it. But seeing it after knowing that he's playing his father and having gone through the book, it's very potent. And, and actually, they, when they were making that film, um, it was so funny because my, my mother was actually kind of playing her mother. And so it was really interesting seeing them working together and being in those characters. Um, I don't know if those of you who have seen the film, but it was, it was a really interesting journey being on the set while they were, um, while they were making that film. So, again, not in the book, because it couldn't be, um, but for the people in the audience. So what was it like being the daughter of Paul Newman and John Woodward. You just said you're on the set of Mr. and Mrs. Bridge. Were you cowed? Were famous people coming over all the time? Did you know they were famous? Did you just accept it? Did you feel privileged, blasé? What, what was it like being the parents of probably, definitely, the most famous movie star couple in the world for many years? Well, you know, it's a funny thing when you so first, when I was young, I had no idea, first of all, who they were, and all I knew is that, you know, my parents went away and worked a lot, and so, for me, on part of the French, it sucked. You know, they were gone all the time, and they would go for big stretches of time, so it wasn't, you know, I didn't, I didn't like it very much, honestly. Um, and then, as I got older, I, you know, I realized what they did, but it was really just what they did for a living. I mean, I, and I only had one set of parents, so I just, you know, I didn't, I didn't kind of know any different. It didn't, 
really hit home until I became a teenager and we were going back and forth as we, you know, it was kind of a funny in, uh, environment that we lived in because we didn't live in LA all the time, which was really unusual. Most, you know, most families, unless you, you're, you know, unless you were, um, your parents were Broadway actors and you lived in New York, but if you're, they were movie actors, everyone lived in LA and we did both. So we, my parents actually, the, there was the, one of the most brilliant things I think they did as parents is that they didn't want us to be in LA all the time, that LA was a really weird place to grow up. I don't know if anybody's here from LA, but I, it's, it's a weird place to grow up. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, I mean, certainly living in Beverly Hills and, and you know, in the 70, 60s, 70s, 80s, it was kind of a weird place to grow up. Anyway, um, so they would pull us back and forth. So we really, any chance we got, we would come back to the East Coast. And in fact, although we would spend sometimes the whole school year in, L in California, when people would ask us, where do you live? We would all say, Connecticut. Because we never we, we never really felt like LA was our home. And so when we were in LA, it was just really weird. I mean, it was, you know, full on movie star hell. I mean, whatever that means when you're a kid, you know, we were chased down the street by paparazzi, we got run over, you know, we got like trampled by we could never see our parents without people, you know. I mean, honestly, I don't know what it must be like now for kids because with the selfies and, you know, it, I, I think it's even more difficult. But at that time, there wasn't any of that, so everything was really personal. So, you know, people would just come and like sit down and while we were having dinner and, you know, they would walk into our house. I mean, my, my, my poor mother occasionally, she'd look out and she'd be like, oh, I want the roses again. And then people would walk in and just start taking the roses and cutting them and stuff. She'd like, oh, you know, so it was kind of a weird, it was a weird thing, but the great thing about all the craziness is that we actually got the flip side when we go to go to Connecticut because in Westport, you know, it was just this like funny artistic town, and Mom, I mean, it was like living in was it Mayberry? Where was the in the fifties? Mayberry. Mayberry. Thank you. So it was like living in Mayberry. They used to drop us off at the base of of you know Main Street and. We could just like walk them down the street and hang out there. Nobody bothered us. It was, so it was great. Sorry, that was a really long answer. No, no, yeah. not at all. I think a good answer. Um, talk a little bit, again, I'm now going back to where we sort of started the conversation about how the book got created. Talk a little bit about Stuart Stern because he was very important to you and to the family and to the book. So Stuart, um, Stuart was one of my parents' best friends. Um, and he was just part of our family. My sister Lissy's middle name is Stuart. Um, and she, that and Stuart was her godfather. Um, he, he was always with us. And the, one of the most yummy, special people I, I mean, when when he passed away, it was a huge loss to the planet. He just was a, a beautiful soul. Um, he was a wonderful writer also, and wrote he wrote all types of stuff. He wrote like Rebel Without a Cause, and he wrote Rachel Rachel for my mother. He wrote, um, I mean, he just, he was incredibly talented. Um, he actually was the interviewer. He was literally the interviewer for all of the interviews of all the transcripts. There were 14,000 pages in total. He did 100 different interviews. Uh, you know, the book is, as Peter said, 70% dad, but even all the other little bits and pieces are from Stewart's interviews. And he was ingenious in because everybody loved him, and so people would just say, I mean, be the most honest, truthful 
person they could be. Everyone adored him. But dad also made sure that that was, you know, part of the, you weren't allowed to be interviewed unless you were going to be completely and totally honest. Um, so anyway, Stuart was a huge part of our life. And he actually even married, remarried, he got his license to, I don't, what's the, Right, to marry to, to marry, but it, uh, there's, I can't remember, he, he told us what it was, I can't remember what it was, it was a special, anyway, he got this special certificate to remarry my parents on their 25th anniversary, and then he proceeded to marry all of us daughters, um, and he, yeah, anyway, he was a huge part of our life. And he also is one of the reasons why the book is so honest, because he interviewed your dad, and I know when you read some of the original transcripts, you do sense a little agitation on your father's part because he is pushing, pushing, pushing to go deeper and deeper and deeper. And that's one of the reasons I think the book is so potent. So Absolutely. We owe him our thanks. Um, Nobody else could have gotten that out of that. <laughs> I mean, he just, he had a way. But your dad obviously had reached a time in his life when he thought of this, again, this is why I like the book jacket so much. He'd spent much of his life not revealing himself to the public for good reason. But then he, he reached a point in his life where he wanted to reveal himself. Oh, he wouldn't have done it with anybody without Stuart. I mean, but Stuart. Did he have the, could he, did he have the writing discipline? I know he was an extraordinary disciplined person. Could he have done it by himself or he wouldn't, what do you think? Um, I'm not sure he would have been able to stay focused because he had so many other things going on. I think he, I think it would have been much more difficult for him to stay focused on it. Is there anything we, that you and I haven't covered before we open it up that you particularly want to talk about this book? Well, I think the one thing that I do want to say about the book, which I think is the most, not most important, but it's the most interesting to me, was that when I read the transcripts and what is so apparent in the book is just how hard he was on himself, which is, which is so surprising. It was, it was um, again, very difficult to read uh, as his kid, but I think the purity of his honesty is so, um, I mean, it, it's easy for me to say, it's overwhelming for me to read, but I think it's, it's unusual. Um, and I'm, you know, it, as his kid, I wish he had allowed me to read it earlier and I would even known that it was available because it, I mean, I'm so, proud of what he was able to say and do throughout this process that it um, it's really it's a it's a remarkable it's a, it's a remarkable journey even as an outsider and let's say the publisher of Knopf is here who when she read the a relatively early draft but close to the finished draft I remember you, we spoke on the phone and Reagan said, I, I've never actually read a book like this. It's, it's unique, partly or largely because of the honesty and while it affected you as an outsider, as I hope everyone here sees and reads for him or herself, that you're reading on the surface Paul Newman coolest public figure ever. Every, every, certainly every boy wanted to be your father. That was your fantasy. And then you read this and it's so valuable because you realize everybody is insecure. Everybody is aware of the flaws. And it's such a moving journey because he is so hard on himself about his flaws and yet becomes by the end of his life, and certainly by the end of this book, the person you want him to be. That's what I thought was so extraordinary about the book and why I think it's
it's so valuable, other than it's also wildly entertaining. Well, the other thing I would add in is that it's interesting, while he is being so hard on himself, what I think is one of the other most interesting things is that nobody else felt that way. So what it, what's so interesting is though is is that I can say, you know, I, I mean, I was his kid, right? So I was there a lot. Mm -hmm. um, but what's interesting about it is that when you read the other people's perspectives, is that they didn't see that, they didn't feel it, they didn't like, they didn't. So that's what it, this disparity between how he was feeling about himself or the work that he was doing or you know how he was living his life and nobody else really got that and so that's what's so interesting is this internal struggle that he was dealing with and still doing all this amazing work and you know getting out there and you know being politically involved and doing all this amazing stuff he was doing all these, having all this internal struggle. And I think that was the hardest part for me to read is how hard he was struggling, you know? And I think we all do, right? We all have our internal struggles, but it's hard when you are reading it in your father's words. And I think that's what's so, um, it's, it's so incredibly moving. Well, as the title says, it is an extraordinary book as well as an extraordinary life. So are there questions that we would like to ask Clea? Yeah. Uh, during his lifetime, did a, another publisher try and push it to write a memoir? Do you mind just repeating that? Sorry. Oh, did, you hear, did other publishers during his lifetime push him to write a memoir? <laughs> oh, uh, I, you know, That's I'm- That's a great question. I'm, yeah. I'm sure they did. Um, and yeah. I, I mean, I don't, I don't know of anybody in particular, but I'm sure there were people that were trying to. I mean, there were lots of really pretty ridiculous things that came out on my father, which I think was another reason why he wanted to dispel, you know, this this fantasy um, and tell the truth about his life. Um, so yeah, I mean, he, he was hound for all types of different crazy things. I'm sure there were lots of people. I don't actually know any, but. My guess is I probably wrote him a letter. <laughs> <about 30 years. laughs> Very well, could be. I, uh, I'm looking forward to reading the book. Um, I haven't read the book yet, but I've read a few excerpts in magazines. And um, I just want to touch on one thing that really touched my heart, because I lost my son also during COVID, but was the death of his son. And I read, um, and I wanted to ask you, through the thousands and thousands of pages of transcripts, I, he, from what I read, he had a lot of shame and guilt from the death of his son and the, I guess, expectations that he placed on him. And, um, what I wanted to ask you, if you found in all these thousands of transcripts, pages of transcripts, how he dealt with his shame and his guilt, did he take it to his grave? Yikes. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's def there's, there were a lot in the transcripts about Scott. Um, and, and how hard he, 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 how hard dad tried, he really didn't have the tools. And he, um, he really, he struggled with it until the day he died. He, I think, um, I don't know, but I, I don't think any, I can't imagine how any parent feels losing a child. I don't, I think he felt like he let him down, that he, but he, he wasn't lost at trying to know how to help. And um, 
I think especially in those days, you know, out in LA, it was like there was the Betty Ford Center and that was about it. And there, you know, people who were born in 1925 didn't know anything about drugs and they just didn't know. And they all knew about alcohol, but they didn't really know. He didn't really know, he didn't even understand the material. You know, he didn't, he didn't understand, he didn't even know what he was looking for. And, um, I mean, I remember when Scott passed away, I, I was quite young, I was a teenager, I was probably 13 or 14 years old, and he couldn't even, he couldn't talk about it, he couldn't, he just felt helpless, and I think, um, I don't, I don't think any parent ever recovers. I'm so sorry for your loss. I don't, I don't know what to say, except it's, I can't even imagine. I think in the book that it's handled quite beautifully in his own words, and that it, it is very tough to read, and it goes on for a reasonable period of time, quite honestly, and then at some point he says, he, Paul, says, you know what, this is enough about this, because the it was such a private thing, he could reveal enough to deal with it, and then when that chapter is closed. So it, it was obvious, you know, what can you say? It's, it's the most painful thing in the book, but quite extraordinary and moving. That's a tough question to follow, but are there, are there, are there any? Yes. the dreaded comment, but then a question. Uh, my comment is, um, and you've both spoken very eloquently about the honesty, and, and, and I've always been struck by that as well, but what I think it's important, what I was also struck by was there's not an ounce of self-pity. You know, he he is very hard on himself, but it, it, he also exhibits for someone born in 1925 an astonishing social awareness of his relative privilege and his you know, the, the advantages that he had, and he never once sounds a note of you know, self-pity or anything other than awareness of all that he's been given, and yet still the things that he felt that he failed at. And I found that incredibly moving and, and honorable. Um, my question is, uh, and Peter, you mentioned the other, you know, the, the other voices, and that was really one of my favorites. As much as I, I love his voice and his honesty and his storytelling, he's a great, he's a great storyteller, and he had a lot of adventures and misadventures, and there's a lot of fun and just like stuff that happens in that life. But it's also wonderful to be reading it, and then suddenly, like, oh, here's Patricia Neal, and here's Walter Hill, and here are these voices of the actual people who have also been long gone. And I just, uh, my question is, was it hard to, I'm sure there are so many more from those thousands of pages. Were there other voices that you, like, you and Peter arm wrestled over? Were there ones that you wanted to get in there? Or um, other things that you, you know, could have made it but were a tough call? I mean, honestly, there was so much information. Um, I, I mean, we, I, the, the book would have been, it would have been like an encyclopedia of, of 47 parts. I mean, it, the only thing, if, if I had one thing to add, I would have added more from family. Because I think, um, and it's hard to add things from your family, but I think, like there's, there's not a lot from from the children, which I think is tricky. I mean, my sister and I did the forward and the afterward, and I think we were trying to not make it about the kids or anything like that, and I think it's really important that it's dad's words, but if there was one thing that I think I might have added, it would be that. Just because I think as a parent, he talks about how, you know, how poorly he was a parent and how, and I, I don't necessarily think, I don't, and I might think about this differently because I don't have children, but I think every parent does the best they can. And I think that he literally did the best he could. He didn't have 
you know, if you read the book, you'll realize, I mean, it was, it was his childhood was pretty tricky. And, um, and I think it took him a long time. I mean, he always used to joke that Newman's were late bloomers. And he was a late bloomer. But when he bloomed, he was like unbelievable. He was like the supersonic father for everybody. You know, so I think that's the one part that it's missing because I think we could dispel that fantasy or that that part of the fable where he talks about not being a good dad. Mm -hmm. And I would say the one uh, one thing it's not missing from the book because it definitely comes through, but it's a serious book. He's writing about his life in a very serious manner. And I know from everything all the daughters have said and in some of the commentary from the other people, George Hill, etc., they all talk about what a great sense of humor he had. And if, if there was anything frustrating in the editing process, and there wasn't a lot other than figuring out how to not to have a 10,000 page book. It was that we were, we only had what was written. You know, we, I mean, he's not around anymore, so we only had the transcripts. And I think the humor does, it does come across, but not as much as you would have liked. He was notorious for having, um, being the worst joke teller on the planet. And not, well actually he wasn't the worst joke teller, he just, he loved telling jokes and he would start cracking himself up and he wouldn't be able to get through it. And it was, and then he would tell the same joke over and over and over again. And he did this to everybody. You know, everyone from Bob Redford to George Roy Hill to his children. And they, some of the jokes were really smutty and he would go and he would start telling these jokes and I'd be like, Dad, you can't tell that in front of my friend's parents. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, he did not, he was not good at managing that. But he did, he had the greatest sense of humor and he was, nobody was better at one-liners than he was. I mean, he was the master. I think one of my favorite stories in the book, sorry, we'll get back to more questions if we still have time, was when he is talking to the producer of On the Waterfront. It's a great story who's, uh oh, now I'm gonna forget his name, Sam Spiegel. And it's in the section your father is talking about being half Jewish and how he responded to that, which is also really interesting. But Sam Spiegel, before he returned to the name Sam Spiegel as a producer, because he didn't want to sound so Jewish, had his credits as S period P period Eagle, E-A-G-L-A. <laughs> and your dad tells a story in the book, which really, I have to say, it made me laugh out loud. It was obviously a sense of humor. Your Paul is being considered for the Marlon Brando part and on the waterfront, and Sam Spiegel says to him, but you have to, you'll have to change your name so it doesn't sound so Jewish. And your father said to him, what should I change it to, S.P. Newman? <laughs> so, are there other, yeah? Sorry, hold on. Oh, wait one second. Thank you for sharing um, your dad everybody and I hope that it's very like you know filling for you to be able to, to it is. Share I love that. talking about it. Awesome. <laughs> good I'm glad for that um, my question was just I haven't read the book yet but I will read it I recently saw that um, you know the series that the docu series yeah yeah with the never know what to call yeah. it so um, and I and I surmise that you're sisters or, and yourself were also involved with that. And I was just wondering, because when you talked about how he's so hard on himself, like that was the one thing that came out the most. Um, I couldn't believe how much that was. And so I just wonder like, if this is a good companion piece to it, or 
you know, like, what is your, um, like, how do you feel about the finished, about the doc project? Yeah. Um, well, it's interesting. So the docu series was, um, I don't know if anybody else has seen it, but it's, it's on my parents. So it's, it's, um, it's, you know, the last, it's called The Last Movie Stars. And um, Ethan Hawke directs, Martin Scorsese executive produces, and it's a wonderful project. It's six parts, and it's, it's kind of very hip and cool, and it's a lot about their acting. I mean, it's a, it's a very, it was a cool project to be involved in. Um, it was complicated having a lot of egos, you know, that were talking about my kind of swing arms. Um, so it, that was a little bit more tricky, um, but I really liked the way it came out, and I think they did a great job. It's it's this is very much a good companion piece because this is just dad. So that was about my parents, it was about their relationship, it was about how their relationship started and the work they did together and their journey as actors and some of the other stuff they did together and their family and, and that's, but that's kind of a different thing. This is really dad's life from, you know, when he was very young, his family, you know, in the service, you know, school, you know, his first marriage, I mean, everything. It's, there's nothing that's not touched until 1991. So it's, it's a very, it's kind of just a different, it's a different piece. It's a good companion piece, but. As, as the editor of the book, it's more than a good companion piece. This is her father talking. The other is outsiders looking in. This is, this is, this is her dad. This is Deep Dad. <laughs> that would have been a good title. Is <laughs> there one more? Can we... One more question? No, no pressure. Oh. Sorry. Yes. Can we... uh, Peter, I mentioned a little bit ago that he was extremely disciplined. I was just wondering uh, what you both think, like which ways or which areas stand out to both of you where he was, that was glaring. Um, you know, he was, he was really disciplined about everything. Um, in fact, he really felt he was just a kid from Shaker Heights, like he couldn't get out of his own way, really, to become an actor and, you know, deep and all this, like, he was so disciplined, he kind of did everything exactly how it was supposed to be done until he didn't. And then when he didn't, you know, he went way the other direction, and then he kind of had to reel it back in. But even when, even when he wasn't disciplined, he still, yeah, he still was. I mean, he even when he was drinking a lot and kind of behaving badly, he still had the most extraordinary work ethic of anybody I've ever known. He was never late on the set. He never wasn't prepared. He, I mean, he would stick his face in. I mean, I remember growing up as a kid, he would go down to the river and we would, as children, run down to the river with an ax and break, um, you know, break ice so that he could jump into the river when it was frozen after he would get out of the sauna to jolt himself so that he could go to work. Like, he, he was, the most disciplined person I know. Um, it's part of the reason why I was such a great race car driver, because he was so disciplined. Um, no matter what. So, he was really dis, I mean, he, even when he was preparing for work, I think that was, people used to, people always thought that he and Bob, were, Bob Redford were really close friends, and they were friendly, but they worked so differently, it was very hard for, I, I mean, I think dad got more comfortable with it when they got older and they were working together. But when they, when they did Butch and Sundance, 
it drove Dad crazy because Bob was late every day, yeah. and and really late. I mean, and, you know, when an act, when the star is late, like mm -hmm. the whole set shuts down because you can't, you know. So you have this whole set of people in the middle of the desert, like waiting for an hour and a half while Bob would show up late, and. Dad finally said to him after about the first week, like, it's either you or me, because I can't do this anymore. Um, and Bob was such a free spirit. He was, you know, everything just came so naturally to him, and Dad really had to, like, super prepare. He was, he was a very disciplined guy. Anyway, did that answer your question? Probably more so. Than <laughs> Thank you all, and now you can all buy your five copies of the book.